some of you are like, man, I'm so tired of talking about dumpster fires, not encouraging. Don't worry, we start the thrill of hope next week, and so make sure you come back, and um, so it'll be a month full of hope and joy and love, and it's going to be great. Hey, uh, if you're taking notes, the top of our message as we wrap up this series today is, where do I sit now? Where do I sit now? Uh, when Tess and I were living in New York City, um, we lived right across the street from Barclays Center, which is where the Brooklyn Nets play, and um, and so we would go to a number of games, but they made the playoffs one year, and they were playing the 76ers, and so we were like, okay, we got to go to a playoff game, and, and uh, so we looked up tickets, and uh, surprisingly, it was more expensive to watch a playoff game that was right across the street from our apartment than it was to drive an hour and 15 minutes to Philadelphia to see them play in Philadelphia. So we bought tickets to go see them play in Philadelphia, and so we did the drive, it takes about an hour and 15 minutes, and um, we were, it was clear that we were cheering for the Nets. And if you are a sports fan, if you have any idea about sports at all, um, you know the worst fans are Philly fans. <laughs> They're terrible. Like, I, I, I genuinely, like, God, what did you do to the people who were Philly fans? Like, something is not right. And, you know, I, when, when we talk about, uh, you know, in the Bible, it says pray for your enemies. That, that's my biggest challenge. I'll be honest. I, I, that's who I find myself praying for the most when I think about praying for your enemies. So we're at this game, and, and it's a pretty back and forth game. And uh, we're, we're like, it's me and Tess, and we got our Nets gear on, and we're surrounded by 76ers fans. And any time, they would do, like, the smallest thing good. I mean, we had people in our face, like, Oh, did you see that? Oh, there we go. There we go. And, and unfortunately, the Nets lost. And I remember leaving. And, and Tess, um, who, if you know my wife, she's as, like, blunt and straightforward as can be. And even as we were leaving, we had fans kind of giving it to us in the parking lot. And, uh, and I remember Tess looking back at a, at a group that had said some things to us. And she goes, she goes, yeah, but at least we get to go live in New York and you're stuck here in Philly. And I was like, I was like, well, you're not wrong, but wow. And uh, but but these people, I, I I I would say this about Philadelphia fans, and if you you know we're in L.A. and I think Dodgers fans feel this way about Padres fans, right? Um, and I'm sure Padres fans feel this way about Dodgers fans. And so, uh, but I, there's something different about those folks in Philadelphia. They just kind of love to stir up the controversy a little bit. And I think we all know people like that, right? They they like to kind of poke the bear a little bit, push the buttons, and they love to play devil's advocate. And whether they enjoy the tension or they're completely oblivious to it, one thing is clear. If you want peace, don't invite that person. If you want calm, don't invite that person, right? They'll bring up the taboo topic. They'll commit the social faux pas, or they'll say the thing everyone else avoids. And with them, there are two kinds of anxiety, right? The the dread that comes before it happens and the fallout after it does. And both of those things leave you on edge, yet they seem to enjoy the chaos and really uh, others' reactions to the chaos. They find those reactions amusing. Now, if you're up for playing a little game on Thanksgiving Day, I want to give you a Thanksgiving bingo. That's what I call Thanksgiving bingo. And so uh, imagine you're making a bingo card and you got a free space there for you in the middle and I'm going to give you some questions that you might get asked or things that might get said to you at Thanksgiving dinner. And I would be curious if any of you would actually get bingo. But I'm going to give you some things that might get asked or things that might get said. Right? Are you dating anyone yet? You got that person in your family, they see you, they haven't seen you in a long time, and they say, you know what, you're looking um, healthy. <laughs> right? For those of us that are... Uh, you know, obviously we're in LA, a lot of people are in the industry, you might go home and get asked, are you still doing that acting thing? Or you might get asked, how much have you had to drink? What's that stuff growing on your face? Why don't you visit more often? I heard you don't want to have kids. And the one that we are all dreading and hoping and praying to God that no one asks, who did you vote for? Now, it's not that you dislike these people, but in certain moments, dealing with them can feel like it's too much. 
And while you can usually avoid them, some encounters are just unavoidable. And for many of us, the holidays are prime time for these moments. Even if you love your family, you know in your family there's a few wild cards. You don't know what they're gonna say or what they're gonna do, right? And recent Thanksgivings often feel like social experiments. Hey, let's put people with opposing views together, add food and alcohol, and see what happens. And I know it's just a few days, maybe even just a few hours, but there are moments where we're not sure that we can sit at the same table with somebody that we're not on the same page with. And that's not how, I don't think any of us want to spend our days off waiting for a bomb to go off. And so what do we do? Do we tough it out or do we skip it? People have been asking this question and wrestling with this question for ages. And one wisdom writer, he wrote this, Proverbs 17, verse one, I love this. He says, better a dry crust eaten in peace than a house filled with feasting and conflict. Now, he might have been talking about Thanksgiving with your in-laws, but the Bible shows that Jesus' followers were sharing tables with people unlike them in heaven is pictured as a diverse banquet. And so how do we get there? Because that's ultimately what Jesus is calling us to. How do we get there? Paul outlined for the early church what it actually takes. Look at Romans 12, 14 through 18. It says this. Bless those who persecute you. Don't curse them unless they're Philadelphia fans. I'm kidding. Pray that God will bless them. Be happy with those who are happy and weep with those who weep. Live in harmony with each other. Don't be too proud to enjoy the company of uh, Philadelphia Phillies fans. Or I'm kidding, I'm kidding. Uh, don't be pr- too proud to enjoy the company of ordinary people. And don't think you know it all. Never pay back evil with more evil. Do things in such a way that everyone can see you are honorable. Do all that you can to live in peace with everyone. Now, some of you hear those verses and you say, well, I'm not asking God to bless someone that I think is a jerk. Living in harmony, not with these people. I'm not prideful, but I do know more than them. If they start something, I'll be sure to finish it. Why should I try for peace when they clearly don't care? Right, if people knew what I deal with, they would understand it. All of those things may be true. But as Christians, the goal isn't to escape the blame of others, it's to emulate the behavior of Jesus. And we're promised that it is going to be uncomfortable. Jesus said some days and some situations, it's going to feel like dragging a cross around, but what does that actually look like? There's a story about a guy in the Old Testament about a man who had every right to take revenge on someone, and his culture would have seen it as justified. But as a follower of God, he believed that he was called to treat his enemies better than they deserved. And we pick up the story in 2 Samuel chapter 9, verse 3a. This is what it says. It says, the king, talking about David, then asked him, is anyone still alive from Saul's family? If so, I wanna show God's kindness to them. Now, this request was shocking to everyone because Saul, who was the king before David, hated him. He said terrible things about him, things that weren't even true. He even tried to kill him. They weren't friends or on the same page, yet David's mindset was, hey, is there anyone in this guy's family that I can show kindness to? Imagine having that mindset. Right, what if instead of asking how can I protect myself, we asked who can I be kind to and who can I bless? And if you're taking notes, you can write this down. To bless someone means to encourage them, to uplift them, to serve them, to resource them, to benefit them, to pamper them. That's what David is saying. He's saying, hey, I I know there was this guy before me who tried to kill me. He said terrible things that weren't true about me. He hated me. We were nowhere near being on the same page, but, but is there anyone in that guy's family that I could bless? Is there anyone in that guy's family that I could, I could love and, and, and show kindness to? Look at what verses three B through four, it says this. It says, Ziba replied, yes, one of Jonathan's sons is still alive. He is crippled in both feet. Where is he, David asked. In Lodabar, Ziba told him, at the home of Makir, son of Amiel. And so Jonathan was Saul's son, making the guy that they're talking about, Jonathan's son, Saul's grandson. 
He's not even named at first. He's just described as the guy who's crippled in both feet. And sometimes we do this too, right? We tend to define people by one noticeable trait or flaw. Maybe you've heard nicknames like Uncle Unibrow or Grandma Maga, right? It's shorthand, but it can keep us from seeing someone as the multidimensional person that God has made them to be in his image. And in this story, it goes deeper because there's a king's family that was expected to be noble and strong. And Jonathan's son has been crippled since childhood. And he was seen as too broken to belong. And his injury wasn't his fault. It happened when he was just five years old. As his nurse fled during a violent power shift, she fell on him, crushing his legs. And this left him banished from the palace and everything good in his life. Could you imagine being banished from your home And really, your identity because of something that happened to you that was not your fault. That's what happened to Jonathan's son. And when David finds him, he's living in a place called Lodabar. Now, the meaning of Lodabar means no pasture or a place of no words. And many theologians believe that it's a metaphor for deep pain and hopelessness. It's where the brokenhearted go to hide and give up. But look at what verse five says. It says, so David sent for him, Jonathan's son, and brought him from Makir's home. And so this young man, he'd stayed hidden off the radar. Then one day, King David's men show up to summon him to the palace. Imagine that journey, how long it felt, the questions he might be asking and the things that are racing through his head. He probably assumed that he was being brought to his execution and it was common to get rid of, for a new king to eliminate anyone connected to the previous ruler to secure the throne. And I can imagine that Jonathan's son, his stomach was in knots, every moment stretching endlessly. And I think we've all had moments like that too, where we've been overcome with dread on the road to see that relative, to see that family member that we don't see eye to eye with. The tension starts days before, You regret committing to it in the first place. You don't want to see them, sit by them, or be near them. The conversation's going to take a turn, and you know that someone's going to say the wrong thing, and chaos will follow, and passive-aggressive comments, and eye rolls, and snide remarks, and it's inevitable. And you're not afraid that they'll kill you, but part of you would rather not face this dinner. And before you know it, you're pulling into the driveway, and it's too late now. Look at what verses six through seven a say. It says, his name, Jonathan's son, was Mephibosheth. He was Jonathan's son and Saul's grandson. When he came to David, he bowed low to the ground in deep respect. David said, greetings, Mephibosheth. Mephibosheth replied, I am your servant. David says, don't be afraid. Now, when someone is afraid, the logical thing to do or the best response is to yell, don't be afraid. Now, I imagine Mephibosheth lying there Heart racing, expecting the worst, but then the unexpected happened. Look at what verse 7b says. It says, I intend to show kindness to you because of my promise to your father, Jonathan. I will give you all the property that once belonged to your grandfather, Saul, and you will eat here with me at the king's table. A long time ago, before Mephibosheth was crippled or David became king, David made a covenant with his friend, Jonathan. David promised to care for Jonathan's family when he became king, not because of anything they did, but because of what Jonathan did. And this act of kindness reflects God's grace. Just as God extends kindness to us, we're called to extend grace to others, giving better than what they deserve. And this is not a suggestion from God. It's not a hey, I think it'd be great if you would give better than someone deserves when you feel like it. No, 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 it's a command from God. Look at what John 13, 34 to 35, Jesus says this. He says, so now I'm giving you a new commandment. Love each other just as I have loved you. You should love each other. Your love for one another will prove to the world that you are my disciples. He says this ought to be a defining trait of those who say they are following me. How you love others should be a defining trait of those who say they are following me. And I wonder if this is the way you treat others. Does it show that you're a follower of Jesus? 
When you sit down to a meal, do your words and actions reflect Christ's love or do they reflect more of your political views or how you feel about someone else? Christ-like love is not just how you love, but it's who you love, showing kindness to those that you'd rather not be kind to. Look at what 2 Samuel 9, verse 8, it says this, Mephibosheth bowed respectfully and exclaimed, who is your servant that you should show such kindness to a dead dog like me? Imagine feeling you don't deserve to even be in the room, let alone at the table, you don't even deserve to be in the room. Thinking everyone will whisper about you once you leave, yet the one person who could shame you instead chooses to encourage you and to honor you. And I know as, 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 as soon as we started this message, some of you have already thought about the person that you can't wait to not see. But could I maybe just give us a different perspective? What if that person that you are dreading finds themselves feeling like Mephibosheth? Knowing that, man, I, I know these people probably don't even want me in the room. They probably don't even want me at the table. And whether it is warranted by them or not, doesn't matter. It doesn't matter to Jesus. It doesn't matter to God. And so I wonder if that person that popped into your head that you were so excited to see on Thursday, what if they find themselves feeling like Mephibosheth does? And what if instead of choosing to not model how Jesus loves us or extends grace to us or is kind to us, what if we modeled what David modeled and really what Jesus does and said encouraged and honored them? That's what God does for you and now we're called to do the same for others. And of course, you don't have to and no one would blame you if you didn't. That's what makes it so powerful. And you might wonder how far should we take this? Look at what verses nine through 13 say. It says, then the king summoned Saul's servant Ziba and said, I've given your master's grandson everything that belonged to Saul and his family you and your sons and servants are to farm the land for him to produce food for your master's household. But Mephibosheth, your master's grandson, will eat here at my table. Ziba had 15 sons and 20 servants. Ziba replied, yes, my lord, the king, I am your servant and I will do all that you have commanded. And from that time on, Mephibosheth ate regularly at David's table, like one of the king's own sons. Mephibosheth had a young son named Micah. From then on, all the members of Ziba's household were Mephibosheth's servants. And Mephibosheth, who was crippled in both feet, lived in Jerusalem and ate regularly at the king's table. And can I tell you, I know that, that, that you're probably um, already dreading a, a part of what Thursday is gonna be like, but can I tell you, there is a God who had every reason to dread us showing up but rather than dreading us showing up, he, he couldn't be more thrilled. He said, oh my gosh, I've been waiting for you to come home. I know you don't feel like you deserve a seat at my table, but can I tell you, I, there's always a seat for you. There's always gonna be a place for you. That's what Jesus does for us, and that is what David is doing for Mephibosheth. David goes to great lengths to honor someone that everyone expects him to kill. And the story reminds us that Mephibosheth's brokenness wasn't fixed by David's kindness. And similarly, I think we hope that showing grace to difficult people will inspire them to change, but that may not happen. If you're taking notes, you can write this down. True grace doesn't give to get. It gives because giving is good. And so don't give grace simply because you want something to look different. Give grace without expecting anything in return because giving is good. We do it because we're called to treat people like Jesus no matter the outcome. And you might be thinking, well, the people I'm dealing with have worse issues and physical brokenness like Mephibosheth, and I get it, so uh, let's get practical as we bring this to a close today. I wanna give you six practices to help you treat difficult people with kindness uh, over the holidays. You were taking us, the first thing is this, make a game plan. Make a game plan. You're setting expectations. You're coming up with a plan whether you realize it or not. Start by brainstorming common interests, activities you both enjoy, like playing a game, watching a game, 
going to a movie. That way you ain't got to talk to them or look at them. Just got to sit next to them. Right? Asking about their hobbies can also create common ground. Without a plan, you might end up saying something awkward or bringing up a hot button topic. The second thing is you got to take care of yourself. You got to take care of yourself. When we serve from depletion, we can become angry or bitter due to exhaustion. It is not selfish to care for yourself, right? So you got to make sure you get enough rest, that you don't skip meals, you stick to your routines, and you bow out when you need to bow out, right? Taking breaks is better than pushing through and being mean. And so here's what that looks like, right? And so I know if you're hosting at your house and you're ready for people to leave, tell them. Just, I'm, I'm just being real. Just tell them, hey, we loved having you, but I think it's time for y'all to go home. <laughs> right? Don't do the passive aggressive thing, right, where you're ready for them to go home and you're thinking about it, so you start cleaning up. How many of y'all do that, right? Because you're hoping they see it and they're like, oh, we should probably leave. They're cleaning up. Right? But you do the passive aggressive thing and you start cleaning up and they look at you and they can see it and you're like, oh, no, no you're fine. You're fine. I'm just going to start cleaning up a little bit. And in your head, you're like, please leave, please leave, right? Uh, one of my favorite authors, she says, clear is kind, unclear is unkind. And so just tell them. You know, there's a loving way, there's a kind way to say, hey, we have really enjoyed having you here at our house with us for Thanksgiving, but it is time for you guys to go home. There's nothing wrong with that, right? And if they feel a certain way about it, that says more about them than it does you, right? And that leads us to the third thing. Expect them to be them. Expect them to be them. Don't be surprised when people act the same as they always do, right? I think expecting things to change or to look different is what leads to even more frustration. And so here's something that maybe can help you. What if you just imagine the difficult family members as sitcom characters, right? Laugh at their quirks as you would a scripted role. Right? We get upset when expectations aren't met. Accept them as they are and just enjoy the moment. Number four, don't take the bait. Right? People who stir up controversy are often seeking connection, not just conflict. And so treat their jabs as a request for attention and give them a task to help the group. You don't have to engage in every argument. Redirect the energy somewhere else. Number five, actively calm yourself. Your body is gonna react when someone says something upsetting and so counteract it with calming actions. Hug a pillow. Some of you are like, no, I'm gonna punch the pillow. <laughs> Take deep breaths, step outside for fresh air, self-soothe with a hand over your heart, right? Because triggers are inevitable. And so plan ahead for how you're gonna handle the things that are gonna trigger you. Lastly, let go of being right. If your goal isn't to justify your perspective, you can then enjoy their company and be curious, genuinely curious about their views. Instead of countering, ask open-ended questions about their beliefs. You don't need to agree, just express interest in their perspective and listen. And listen. I think staying curious actually helps to keep us calm and in a learning posture, not a defensive one. And so here's what this looks like, right? My mom is flying in on Thursday morning. Don't ask why she loves to fly in on Thanksgiving morning. I tried to buy her a plane ticket on Wednesday. And she said, no, 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 there's too many people at the airport. There's no one at the airport on Thursday. I want to fly on Thursday. Great. And, um, and I know, I, like, when you talk about making a plan, expecting them to be them, here's how this plays out, right? As soon as my mom gets in the car, she's going to look at me. She's gonna look me up and down. She's gonna see what I'm wearing. If she doesn't like it, she's gonna make a comment about it. Right, so I gotta be ready. That's a trigger for me. I gotta be ready for that. Right, and then she's gonna look at me again and she's gonna ask me, you still working out? I'm gonna say yes. And then she's gonna say, hmm. <laughs> right, and so how I respond is completely dependent on my plan going into it. Right, if I don't have a plan, if I haven't like, prepared my heart and my mind and my soul to receive the things that I know I'm going to receive, I'm gonna react and not respond. Right? And so I know that when she gets in the car, 
I know the first thing that I need to do is, is direct her, redirect her energy towards her grandson that she's really coming to see, not me. Right? And then when she does say the things that she will inevitably say, right? She's going to say, oh, you working out? I'm saying, yeah, I'm still working out. Hmm. Right? And she's going to question. She's like, oh, you know, you look a little heavy, like you gained a little weight. I, just, I don't know if it's like an Asian thing, but they're just very honest. And, um, and, and, and you know what? Instead of reacting to it, if I'm prepared, you know what I can do? I can say, mom, I love your hair. Your hair looks so good. Did you, did you get it done before you came? It looks so good. Oh my gosh, mom, I love your glasses. Are those new? And you see how different that feels, right? Rather than reacting, I'm choosing to respond with kindness. I'm choosing to respond by saying, hey, I wanna, I wanna bless you with my words. I know you are saying things that might be triggering to me, but mom, I, it, it's maybe unfair for me to expect you to change at this stage of your life. You are who you are, and I love you for that. Because I think it's funny when you say those same things about other people, right? Not about me, but when you say about other people, I think it's hilarious. But man, I, how different would it be if you said, you know what? Someone says something to you that maybe triggers you a little bit, and you just say, you know what? I really love that sweater on you. I think it looks so good. You see how the, how the, how the energy shifts in just saying those things? It's powerful, and if you're a follower of Jesus, here's why this approach is essential. If you're taking notes, here's our big idea today. A Christian's responsibility is to care and connect, not convict and convince. A Christian's responsibility, your responsibility this holiday season with the people that drive you crazy, the people that you are so over the moon, over the top, excited to see, that is sarcasm, your responsibility, if you say I'm a follower of Jesus, is to care and connect with them, not convict and convince them. The Holy Spirit convicts, not us. And the reality is God loves that person far more than you ever will. And so changing someone's long-held beliefs is not likely to happen over a three-hour meal. And so take the pressure off and just focus on caring for and connecting with them. And to help get into that headspace, I want to challenge us all to pray this prayer this week. Jesus, help me look for opportunities to love, listen to, and learn from those I'm tempted to lecture. Jesus, help me look for opportunities to love, listen to, and learn from those I'm tempted to to lecture. And mom, I know you're gonna watch this. I need you to pray that prayer before you get on that plane. <laughs> we got you for seven days. <laughs> Peter, Peter wanted people to know God and believe the truth and follow Jesus. And from all the time he spent with Jesus, this is his best advice to bring people to that place. And weirdly, it's not about fighting with your family over a meal. Look at what 1 Peter 2, verse 12, it says this, be careful to live properly among your unbelieving neighbors, then even if they accuse you of doing wrong, they will see your honorable behavior and they will give honor to God when he judges the world. Jump to verse 17. He says, respect everyone and love the family of believers. Fear God. And, and fear God is to not be afraid of God. It's to have a deep reverence for who God is and how God has called us to live. And if we do, we would not just respect him, but we would end up respecting everyone that God has put in our life. And I wonder, what if that were our goal this holiday season? That this would be everyone's experience of you. What would that do for them? What would that do for you? What would that do for their view of God? Peter seemed to think that it would do a lot, and I believe that Peter is right. Can I invite you to stand? I wanna pray for us. Jesus, we love you. We thank you for who you are. We thank you for what you've done and what you're doing. God, thank you for the way that in every season of our life, whether we are deserving or undeserving, you choose to show kindness and love and grace to us. You choose to encourage and honor us the same way that David chose to honor and encourage and love and serve and be kind and gracious to Mephibosheth. And I pray that... Uh, as we head into this week, as we look ahead to Thursday, and maybe we're filled with anxiety already, I, I, I think most of the anxiety probably stems from being focused on the other person more than we are focused on ourselves and, and what we can control in it. 
And so Jesus, I pray, would you uh, help us to, to look inward first, that we would center our hearts, our minds, and our souls with who you've called us to be, with everything that you are. Would we spend more time fixating and ruminating on our relationship with you rather than thinking about the person that we are worried about conflict with? And in that space, as we kind of focus and center ourselves with you, I pray that you would fill us with your peace. The Bible tells us that you give us a peace that surpasses all understanding, meaning it does not make sense to us in this world, but we know it when we experience it. And the beautiful thing is we don't just get to experience it, but God, I believe that we can usher in that same peace. And so would you help us? Would you help us to recognize that every single one of us probably finds ourselves at different rooms, at different tables, feeling just like Mephibosheth? And what an opportunity we have this holiday season to do what David did, to do what you have done for each of us time and time again. Would you help us? We love you, we bless you, and it's in Jesus' name we pray, and everybody said, Amen and amen. Happy Thanksgiving, and we'll see you next week. Southfields Church, I just want to take a moment and say thank you for watching our service online. Whether you're watching it for the first time or you're watching it again because you enjoyed the service so much from the weekend, I'd like to take a moment and dive into our giving. Every week we give people the opportunity to give back and give to the local church so that God can continue to bless your lives and bless your finances. Here at South Hills, we believe that everything comes from God. We believe that he's the one that chose us and brought us into this world, gave us our gifts and talents and abilities. And I just want you to know that when we give, we are giving back what God has already given to us. If you've ever seen any of our envelopes at a South Hills campus, you'll see on there that it says, every week at South Hills, your generosity is giving people the opportunity to live a better story. And there's a scripture on there in Matthew chapter 6, verse 21 that says, where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. So I want to encourage you today to click down below and set up your giving, whether it's for the first time or whether you're doing reoccurring giving. We have four ways to give here at South Hills. One, you can do it in person at any of our campuses through an envelope. Or two, you can actually text any amount that you would like to to 84321. And the third way is to download our Church Center app. I encourage you to do this one because a church center app gives you opportunity to stay connected with our church and your campuses. It's a great tool and resource for you to know what's going on. And the fourth way to give is to give online. You can go to southhills.org slash give and you can set up your giving there. Whether you're a guest of our church or whether you are a member of our church, whether you simply just like to watch our services, I encourage you to trust God with your finances so that he can bless and anoint your finances, and you can be trusting God in this journey of living life to the fullest. I love you, and thank you for watching our online service today.